I did forget one announcement. So as we're still in a time of COVID, um, what we're doing is wearing our masks when moving around the building. So we wear masks over our nose and mouth as we move around. And as we're seated, please wear them as comfortable. If you can wear them the entire time, please do. And when we're singing, we make sure to wear masks as well. So um, still practicing social distancing as well and not holding coffee hour at the moment. But we'll let you know when that changes. So. With that, our opening hymn, Come Ye Thankful People Come, is 694. Thank you. You may be seated. Um, our call to worship is printed in the bulletin. Come to worship Jesus Christ, Alpha and Omega, the one who is, who was, and is to come. Come to worship Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. Good Shepherd, True Vine, Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace, Come to worship Jesus Christ, King of the Kings, Lord of the Lord. To Him be glory and dominion, 
A unison prayer is also printed in the bulletin. Would you join with me? Shepherd of Israel, hear our prayer as your son for the sea of the criminal crucified in this day. Gather into Christ's holy reign the broken, the sorrow, the future, with all the wholeness, joy, and forgiveness. Our Old Testament reading comes from 2 Samuel 23, 1 through 7. Now these are the last words of David, the oracle of David, son of Jesse, the oracle of the man who God exalted, anointed God of Jacob, the favorite of the strong one of Israel. The spirit of the Lord speaks through me. His words are upon my tongue. The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me, the one who rules over people justly, ruling in the fear of God is like the light of the morning, like the sun rising on a cloudless morning, gleaming from the rain on the grassy land. Is not my house like this with God? For he has made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things, and secure. Will he not cause to prosper all my help and my desire? But the godless are like thorns that are thrown away, for they cannot be picked up with the hand. To touch them, one has to use an iron bar or the shaft of a spear, and they are entirely consumed in fire on the spot. And our New Testament reading is coming from Revelation 1, 4b through 8. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Christ Jesus, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving as God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming in the clouds. Every eye shall see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account all tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am Alpha and Omega, says the Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. The second hymn this morning is Rejoice the Lord as King. This one is one of the a cappella ones, so it's not too hard. 715, um, please rise and do your best. <laughs>
you. It sounded beautiful to me. Our gospel reading is coming from John 18, 33 through 37. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you ask this on your own or did others to tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and chief priests have handed you over to me. What is it that you've done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say I'm a king. For this I was born and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. The word of God for the people of God. Our readings for today were pretty interesting. 
it's tempting for me to look at the second Samuel reading and point out all the oddities and think, I want to do a sermon on that. Especially towards the end when we start to get towards thorns and fire, I'm thinking, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh, what's going on? Suffice it to say, sin is like a vicious vine, a thorny vine that you don't want to touch with your bare hands, and that's sort of what they're saying. Um, It's a colorful way to say they wouldn't touch it with a pole or with the end of a spear. It's sort of saying, you wouldn't touch sin with a 10-foot pole. (laughs) That's sort of what they're getting at. But if you're listening to this reading and you've been here for a couple weeks and thinking, this sounds out of place. I thought we were in Hebrews and Mark. There's a reason why it's out of place. You'll notice that we aren't in the same narratives anymore. We're now picking selective readings. It's gone to the days of following David's narrative or following the story in Hebrews with the priests. No longer do we have the Cliff Notes version of Hannah. This is the last Sunday of what's called ordinary time before Advent. I'm having trouble believing that Advent is next week. (laughs) It does not seem possible, and I don't feel quite as prepared as I did for last year. But good thing that Advent is a season of waiting. We haven't hit the Christmas season yet. We're in the Advent season next week. Advent is a season of anticipation and preparation. And the worship team and I had some fun planning that on Tuesday night. But this is the last Sunday before Advent. It's a bit of anticipation in itself. And you think, shouldn't the last Sunday have a name then, if it's this final culminating Sunday before Advent? It does. It's called Christ the King Sunday. It's the last Sunday in the church year, which goes through cycles every three years. You have year A, B, and C. We're just finishing up year B this Sunday and heading into year C next Sunday. If you'll notice the reading from our gospel, it was not part of the Mark passage. We're not hearing the story about the widow and the story about the Pharisees and the scribes. We're we're done with that narrative for a while. Our New Testament reading was not from Hebrews. It was from Revelation. That's quite a difference. It's pretty much due to it being Christ the King Sunday, which is usually celebrated more thoroughly in other church traditions. Uh, We as Methodists don't always celebrate some of the things that are um, in more high church places. And often Christ the King Sunday is not celebrated that thoroughly in Protestant churches. So this, this special Sunday, Christ the King Sunday, is relatively recent. When I looked up when it came about, It was the early 1920s, and it came about in Catholicism. So, as I was scanning for information about Christ the King Sunday, what is this about? I realized it's a feast day. So, with the amount of feast days listed in Catholicism and in the Episcopal Church and sometimes in the Lutheran Church, I would say that those churches know how to party. (laughs) There are a lot of feast days. So I actually recently attended Mass on a Saturday, two weeks ago, I think, and I found myself in a completely different world. Growing up, I didn't attend Roman Catholic churches very often. Um, When I did, I was like, oh, it's kind of churchy, it's fine. I really never thought about the differences. But now after seminary, I'm like, oh, this is very different. Um, I felt like I was in, again, a completely different world from walking in and seeing a blue painted ceiling with golden stars painted all over with one purple wall, one blue wall, fleur de lis everywhere. I'm thinking, that's weird. The priest was in um, a robe with, I think something that's called a chasuble. I have to look at my terms again. And he processed up the aisle after someone who was holding a pole with a cross on the top and was walking, facing the cross. There was uh, stations of the cross all over the walls, and they were in this gleaming gold. It just felt really like regal. I felt like I was in some place that was either really holy or really rich. I, one of the things that stood out to me the most was that they rung bells at communion. It startled me as I was sitting there watching the elements getting blessed, knowing that I couldn't partake in them. I heard a bell ringing and thinking, uh-oh, but it was part of the service. So perhaps, Christ as king is uh, more clear to churches who are more liturgical. 
churches who are more used to, to regal symbolism. And maybe king's speech, talking about Christ as king, happens more when you have more gold in your church, when you're more used to a, a regal setting. When I was Googling images for Christ the King Sunday, there were a lot of images of a European Jesus, the white Jesus wearing the medieval crown, holding a scepter, and thinking, it's very medieval. <laughs> the image of Christ as king, I think, adapts depending on what culture you're in. My friend, who is also a Catholic, sent me an image of a Chinese Jesus for Christ the King Sunday, and it was a very completely different robe and everything. Everything looked very Chinese. So now, when we're at the pinnacle of the church year, the very end before we descend into Advent, into a new year, at the pinnacle sits the king, the ruler, the one who sits above all. So, what does Christ the king mean to you? I think our John passage, the one with Pilate, and our Revelation passage are kind of helpful for deciphering what Christ as king means. In 21st century America, we're fairly separated from the idea of king, so the Bible has to give us some insights on what that would look like. Sure, we talk about King David pretty often. When we think of kings, immediately David or Solomon, maybe some of the other rulers who came in and conquered come into our minds. Some of us might think of medieval imagery. I know that I still do. I try not to, but despite being historically inaccurate, I will need to do some more research to be able to get an accurate photo in my brain. We still use the language of kingdom really often in our church readings. If you think about it, even in our Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come. I hear some churches move towards a more neutral word. They say kingdom, K-I-N, kingdom, instead of kingdom. I think for us, we might reject the idea of a king since we fought for independence <laughs> a couple of years ago from a king. And now we have presidents and governors and other people who rule for us, but they're not, they're not kings. However, it seems to me that these passages that suggest that Christ is tend to be more apocalyptic than they do presidential. Christ as king means something other. It's something we can't quite understand, even though it's pointed to throughout all of Scripture. Apocalyptic, or pointing towards the end time, eschatological, or pointing towards something otherworldly. Similar to how a Protestant felt sitting in the Catholic Church, I'm staring at these symbols and thinking, Christ as king is something that I don't think I fully understand. Pilate tried to wrap his mind around Christ as king, but he could only see it in political, political terms. Are you king of the Jews? Well, you say I am. <laughs> Pilate's like, I'm not a Jew. Tell me, are you king of the Jews? He's from a different religion. He's from a different understanding. And while we may say confidently, God is Alpha and Omega, who is and who was and is to come, still that phrase doesn't make a lot of sense. And we may sing, though he comes in clouds descending, we did at Hogansburg and at Grace Church, it doesn't mean that that makes a lot of sense either. Lo, he comes in clouds descending. It's apocalyptic, and it also is where precipitation comes from. The thing that comes descending from clouds is snow. Even if Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world, it still doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> That's odd. I challenge you to describe where Jesus' kingdom is where we will go to, where he has gone to. Our best effort might be to look up or point up or say it's somewhere more beautiful than here. But we can't describe it. What is that kingdom? I think that's why the apocalyptic literature is so important, because it tries to describe something that is so otherworldly that we just can't get used to it. 
These words help us glimpse something that is from another world, that is something that we're heading toward, something that we are ultimately hopeful for. Just as kings can be generous and gracious, kings can also be strict and disciplined. Though Jesus had so many titles, we are reminded that Christ is God, and God is the head of our lives. Christ is king means we are fully a part of a kingdom, a kingdom, if that's the language that you like better. Here and now, we are, but also into the future. And the New Testament is full of advice on how to live into the kingdom here and now, but also into the future. Even if it doesn't make a lot of earthly sense, even if it's sometimes in symbolic language, we still know our place. So I challenge you, again, to think about the kingdom of God and what it asks us to be like. How do you participate? It's more than just paying taxes. Do we live like we're in a kingdom? We definitely live in an earthly society, but what about the heavenly one? I think of the saying, store up treasures in heaven, or the kingdom of God is justice and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So as we recognize Christ as our head, our king, not of this world, but of the next, and as we wrestle with all of what that means for us, sometimes we feel more like Pilate, sometimes we feel more like one of the Jews, take heart that there is instruction in our Bible. We have faithful scribes and apostles, dwellers of the kingdom already, who want to help us out. May we be thankful for the work of those who have gone before us, and ever so thankful that on this feast day, on this joyous occasion, we're thankful for the one who laid down his life so that we may be rejoined to our creator. Amen. Okay. So at this time, offering in doxology, we don't collect money um, right now. We usually just put the money or gift ties into the plate on the way in or the way out. So this is just a time to bring forward what we've gathered and be thankful for it. So we sing and do a prayer, and we're thankful for all that God gives us as a church, but also personally. Accept these gifts, Lord. Bless them and break them. Make them be justice and peace for this community and the community around us. Amen. Okay. Pastoral prayer is printed in the bulletin. It's a responsive reading. In peace we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work. For our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are outside. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who are protected, security, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For 
For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For Bishop Webb, E.S. Whedon, and all bishops and other ministers. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation. Hear us, Lord. Your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King, and praise to your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, that your loving kindness be upon them and put their trust in you. Join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory of God. Amen. Our closing hymn is O Sing a Song of Bethlehem on 179.
just want to give an extra thank you to Carolyn and Jean, who have been our pinch hitters today. This has been wonderful. I really enjoyed hearing piano and guitar and acapella. It's been a treat. Receive the benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. <laughs>